We are here for, I believe it is the fifth panel of the link up today. So this one is called The Diary of a Girl Boss. So I started this one because I wanted to bring you guys, I guess, just more access to other girls that are like us a bit. So the girls that are thinking about many different things in, at one time or that already know what they want to be able to do and then just kind of giving you insights into how they really got there. So we have, for example, Balvinder, who was the president of Hyperlink. She led a team of 140 students. We have Sophie, who I met during my time at Renaissance Three. So she's a service desk analyst. So she's already done an apprenticeship. So I want to bring them on so they can give you different, different perspectives, really. Because I feel like when you think STEM, you think either mathematics or you're thinking that you have to be like cooped up in a desk or in a lab somewhere. But these guys are out there, you know, they're working, they're studying, they're doing research and they're doing so many different things. We have another panelist as well who's joining us. Her name is Giovanna, so she'll be joining us a bit later. So I'm just going to get in the meantime, we'll have Balvinder introduce herself first so that she can just tell us who you are and then also what it is that you're doing. Hi, everyone. So as Cameron introduced me, I'm Balvinder. I will be entering my fourth year of my Master's of Biomedical Engineering this September. I come from Malaysia. And in terms of my extracurriculars, I was the president of Hyperlink. I did lead about 140 students to build a Hyperloop pod prototype and compete at international competitions. I am now the team manager for Cybathlon QM, where we build low-cost assistive devices for the visually impaired. And I'm also a robotics research assistant at my university's robotics center. Wow, this is amazing. So I, I will definitely be diving into the kind of work that you're doing as a research assistant. But in the meantime, I'm going to head over to Sophie and get you to explain a little bit about who you are and the kind of work that you're doing. Hi, yeah, I'm Sophie. Um, I'm a service desk analyst. So service desk is, if you imagine you work in an office and something's gone wrong with your tech, you run around to the IT department and you ask them a question and that could be either to do with hardware and software errors, or it could be that you want to purchase a new phone, um, or it could be providing you with access to calendars or to different various systems. The idea is to assist users in the office to fix or to grant whatever they need as efficiently as possible with transparency uh, so they can continue on their day and do an amazing job for our company. Wow. Very, very cool. So we'll get Sophie to explain a little bit more. So I think, Sophie, if you, for the people that don't know, what is an apprenticeship and then what made you choose to do one? Okay, so I there's two main, well, there's three main options you can do after school. So there is the option of going into uni and doing a course for maybe four or five years in your specialised area. Um, or you can go straight into a job and choose whatever career you'd like to do. There is a bit in the middle called an apprenticeship, and that's where basically you would be doing sort of, yeah, you'd be studying and you'd be doing Microsoft courses, you'd be doing expert level um, certifications on the side, as well as having a full-time job and being employed and getting paid um, so that you can, in a year and a half of doing all of that, um, you are given a nice certificate and you already have all these exams behind you and knowledge behind you and you've worked in a company for a year and a half. So you're a really good candidate for if you want to stay on at your company or if you want to go elsewhere. Um, that's what an apprenticeship is and I think it's brilliant. And um, yeah, I got into it as I knew I wanted to Go. I kind of knew already what I wanted to do. I wanted to work in IT operations, uh, as in sort of being in the office and helping out users with whatever their issues are, and then just being that you know reference point. Um, and rather than going to a university, because I did look at the courses, a lot of the courses are more at the time tailored towards software dev or security or you know things like that, not necessarily for the the cables and the networking and that sort of thing um but I didn't want to go straight into a job because that would be a lot of pressure at the age of 18 and I kind of wanted to still enjoy studying and also learn how you should be in an office and all these wonderful things so 
Yeah, never look back. Yeah. I think that's really cool, especially that you were able to know what it was that you wanted to go into from such a young age. And then to be able to pursue that, I think is really fascinating. So I'm going to go over to, I think just because Giovanna has now joined us, so hopefully you'll be able to just kind of introduce yourself a little bit and then tell the students what it is that you are doing at the moment. Yeah. Hi, guys. My name is Giovanna Thalbaraja, and I'm founder of Scientia News, and I'm a current master's student at King's College London, and I'm specializing in um, stem cell biology. Um, so Scientia News is a website with free articles and resources and we have that as like an accessible tool for students across the globe. So currently I have around 60 volunteers across the UK um, writing on topics that they're passionate about from biology, chemistry, maths. And yeah, that's what we're doing. I'm going to go back to Bao at the moment. So but Babin, you already mentioned that you're actually we were in the same year as well, but you're going a little bit further in the way that you're going to be doing a master's in engineering for um, biomedical engineering. So can you explain, I guess, why did you want to do the master's and why why not just stay as a bachelor's? Well, the first reason would be because a lot of people in my family do have a master's of engineering. So it'd be a bit odd if I just had a bachelor's. Um, and another thing is that I I. It, I guess it just comes with a certain level of like, you know, oomph if you say you've graduated with a master's of engineering. So that, that was what I was chasing for. And I actually really like Queen Mary's, the way that they structure their fourth year. It's a lot more, you get a lot more free will of what you want to do, especially with like the modules that you get to choose. And because the cohort will be significantly smaller as well, you get to be in touch with like a lot of your professors a lot more personally. So then that that would help you with your career a lot more. I think that's a really good point. Um, I wanted to ask, I guess, Giovanna, because you're here now. So can you tell us a little bit more about what is Science and News and then what inspired you to start it? Yeah, so um, we had a module in my final year of undergrad uh, where we had to look at um, research journals and articles and they gave us a task to try and write it in a more of an understanding manner so that if we give it to anyone to read, they'd be able to understand it, um, which I found really interesting because we've not really done anything to do with communication or journalism. Um, so having that sort of gave me that idea that we need tools where we have um, more accessible information as well as reading pa- rather than reading papers that's like 70, 80 pages long, um, we're able to cut that down for everyone to sort of understand um so that's how I sort of started it um and it's been amazing to try like finding new people through like LinkedIn um that are working in scientific communication and journalism because I feel like that's a very underrated part of the STEM industry especially like now when I'm trying to I guess learn a little bit more about STEM and especially all the research papers that we have to get through they're complicated (laughs) they're really heavy it's, it's good to know that at least somebody is working on making it a bit more easy <laughs> to understand. Because I wish I, I'm not like, I wish I had you when I was in first year. <laughs> so many papers to read. Um, so I guess I what I wanted to do, especially in this session, because the goal of this of the link up is to see it is to be it. I really wanted to show girls that you know there are successful women, even if you know we're just students, but we're still you know we're women in STEM, working towards you know technology engineering, Giovanna's on the science side. So I wanted to get, if you guys could explain a little bit about what made you want to pursue STEM and like, why, why did you pick it and what, what kind of motivated you to get into it? Was there a, a turning moment? If you could talk a little bit about that. So I'll start off with you about, and then I'll just kind of make my way around <laughs> the room. Okay. Um, I would say, I mean, for STEM overall, because a lot, like a lot of my family members, once again, are from STEM backgrounds. My dad is an engineer. My mom has done psychology before. My uncles are engineers or doctors. So I grew up in that environment. Um, also, my aunts are also engineers and doctors, you know, because it's a women and like girls in STEM, thing, you know. Um, so, yeah, I was at first I thought I was going to be a doctor as well. And I had applied for like my UCAS and everything. I had gotten medical spots in the UK and everything until I watched uh, this like um, this Instagram video 
So it was around the time of where like COVID was hitting Malaysia really badly. And there was this Instagram video of how they would like intubate the person where they cut the throat and they put the little like um, uh, tube in. And when I saw that, I kind of, I was like, I don't think I can do this. I don't think I can physically be able to cut a human person or do anything like that. And even before I had a bit of my doubts here and there, I did do my work experience in a hospital. I saw a lot of things and I, in my head, I was like, I cannot believe I have to do this. I was, so, you know, it was just like, I don't really want to do medicine because of the hospital aspect of it. I really like the science aspect of it. And at the time, I had not realized, I had not known that biomedical engineering was a thing. So I was very heavily involved with like school competitions that involve electrical engineering or like the very basics of it. So when I got to like kind of switch my course, I found out about biomedical engineering. And that's that's how I got into this. And I've never looked back. I am so happy every day. I'm so grateful to be in this course because it's exactly what I want to do in my life. I want to use my brains to help those in need. I love that. I think that that's, that's very, it sounds a bit similar to how I got into biomedical engineering myself because I didn't know the word for it, but I was still doing you know robotics competitions and getting involved in different things at school. So it's just, it's fascinating that like when you're coming up in school, the little things that you're doing, even if it's something in the classroom, that you never know what you're going to pick up. And that's really going to kind of impact where you end up going in life. So it's, it's quite fascinating, especially for STEM. Most of the time, it's just a textbook. You know, they're like, here's a diagram of a person. And you're like, that sounds good. I'll pick that. <laughs> so that's why I think stuff like this is really important to be able to show them the different kinds of things that are going on. And Giovanna, we talked about this. So just as a, a sneak peek, people, <laughs> we did a podcast episode together that's recorded and being edited in the process. <laughs> so when we were talking, you spoke a little bit more about, um, you know, the things that we were doing with um, genetics and the stem cells, you don't really dive that deep into it at school. So I wanted to ask you, especially because you're now pursuing that as your master's, you know, you're doing the regenerative medicine and stem cells. I might have said it the wrong way around, but you're looking into that more now. So what motivated you to go from, you know, studying it in high school and then really kind of picking that as to something to focus on now? Yeah, so I studied um, international baccalaureate. So again, that's when they sort of started mentioning about stem cell at a very brief level. Um, but when they mentioned that they could use those type of cells to cure diseases, that's what like sparked my you know um, attention to that. And I really wanted to look more into it. Um, so when I did my undergrad, again, they mentioned it very briefly about what stem cells was, but they never went that deep into like how like how it can help cure diseases so that's why I wanted to try and pursue a master's in that and specialize in that because I want to look into how cells can be used to cure like basically anything which um which has been amazing to see I've learned so much this whole year about the number of diseases that can be cured the amount of startup companies that are launching um stem cell based and gene based as well um so yeah I'm quite excited to delve deeper into that in the future that's exciting. And then for you, so so what got you interested in IT? Because I just, you know, we, for Sophie and I, we were inter- I interned underneath of her. So Sophie was my mentor <laughs> when I was at Renaissance 3, learning a bit more about the IT service desk. And I remember you mentioning that your dad was, in, was involved in IT. So was that one of the things that got you interested in it? Or was it something else? What got you interested in? IT? It's funny because... My dad has always worked in IT. When I was younger, I thought, oh, I'd never work in IT. Gosh, it's, it looks awful. But when I was in school and in education, I really enjoyed, you know, the the reading a textbook, the learning stuff, and then trying to, I didn't know how to apply all the knowledge that I kind of got, and it felt kind of, I don't know, annoying. Um, but when I got into college, I realised there were so many different IT and tech courses there was like media there were gaming everything like that so I went for IT um you know learned all about computers and that a lot of it includes documentation you have to constantly learn things all the time because you know it's not Windows 7 anymore and so many other things TVs change all the time phones change all the time you have to learn all different security policies um so 
yeah, I enjoyed the college course um, when I was 16 to 18. So I decided to go ahead with the apprenticeship. That's the next step. And I just learned so much. And like, it's amazing how you, there's so many exams that you have to, or at least be knowledgeable of for Microsoft or CompTIA, all the networking bits or the security bits, everything that makes a computer and the network system and an online system tick essentially and getting to know the user base is really rewarding as well and um, there's always a reason behind uh someone logging a ticket and you keep in the transparency with the users as you go up to their desk and you know resolve their issues etc and it's really rewarding the knowledge that you gain and the connections that you gain as well it's very it's very rewarding and there's a lot of quick wins and long wins etc um you get to be part of like the tech team and we also kind of you know we were sort of the middle ground for lots of other departments for their applications um etc so it's just brilliant all the every aspect that I wanted to know about I found in service desk and you know six seven years on I've done two apprenticeships by now and you know it's brilliant so yeah fascinating I think that something that I've been like kind of learning a bit more during the day especially here at the link up listening to different women that I've been speaking with is that a lot of the fields are more interdisciplinary than we get told so you know you have to pull people from different um, backgrounds and you get to learn a little bit more on the job than you would have expected because I feel like you know on paper it's just like I'm a service desk analyst but then actually in practice like you mentioned there's so many different parts that you have to pull from, especially like having worked with you, looking at the networking and then the other different parts, you have the hardware, you have the user side. It's just, it's a lot. <laughs> and then yeah. you, you get to some of the other fields of STEM as well. You know, you can see from different different perspectives, all these different, and yeah, it's very interdisciplinary and really practical. Right? So actually, I want to actually run it for her perspective on this, especially because, you know, as the founder for Science and News, you have volunteers from many different subjects. So you have the physics, the medicine, math, all the sciences. <laughs> so if you could talk a little bit more about um, that experience in terms of managing more of an interdisciplinary team. And then Val, I'm going to get you to give your points as well, because you have experience for sure with Hyperlink. So Yvonne, if I can start with you. Yeah. So yeah, I think it was really hard at first trying to find people, but I think LinkedIn was like the best option for me to connect. Um with everyone and some people I'd met from Queen Mary were interested about my idea so that's why it sort of sparked that um and it's crazy that now that I've got at least like a manager for each of the subjects that are on my website so I've already got a management team for that and altogether like 60 volunteers um across all the subjects um and it's been and it's been like quite amazing that we've connected with so many people and like some people message me saying that oh this person's doing the same course as me and I've never met them before but now I've connected through Scienti News and now I know who they are and like you know everyone's making friends and you know working together to make a difference in STEM as well which is amazing to see and um, yeah it's great that I've met people from complete different backgrounds learning what they're interested in and passionate about um and also you know supporting each other as well in anything um but yeah it's been a very rewarding experience working with everyone and I just hope that I can you know grow into a bigger thing than it is right now. I'm going to come over to you for your perspective as well on just kind of managing an interdisciplinary team. I will agree with you you know it is a bit difficult at times especially in the beginning when you're trying to get everything up and running but I'm very thankful to have had like a very strong committee for the past two years leading all these 140 people they're very passionate and they're very they know they know when to get work done and they know how to push others so that was very good and another thing I think which was which kind of inspired like a this amount, this good number of people is that the opportunities you get after participating in a engineering society because I do know some people who have gone on to work in Rolls Royce or BMW has a placement year after working in Hyplink. So I would I would think that Hyplink did play a solid part in getting them those jobs. So that's something we kind of like um be, 
the 140 students with i guess like this is really good brownie points for your cv and yeah um yeah it's been a tremendous experience for the past 2 years i am no longer part of that but it's been an amazing experience and the less and i think that one of the things that you guys have well at least it's been hinted at in the what the what you've been saying is that when you're leading these teams you also become a bit of a a mentor for them as well because you're you're training them you're helping them out and sophia no you have experience as well being a mentor in terms of the it btech the students for um challenge for college So could you talk a little bit about your experience as a mentor there and the impact that you might have seen it have on the students? Yeah, so I recently spoke I recently went back to my previous college before I came to this apprenticeship. Um I spoke with three classmates in a row and there were some very I spoke about, you know, I had a little slide show about, you know, what the company does and what what I covered in my apprenticeships and how there's a portfolio you have to write about there's a exam at the end that's kind of monitored by a camera essentially um we have to build a network under simulation explain how you did it and why um and then there's like a interview at the end and how you have to really know your stuff by the end of it but you're guided along the whole way um by you have a skills coach during your apprenticeship and you also have obviously your managers and your team when you're an apprentice um so I was explaining all this to the students at the college and there were quite a few attentive students who were making notes or they were asking questions about um you know how qualified do they have to be to even get into an apprenticeship because they were under the belief they had to have prior experience of IT maybe they had to build a PC when they were 10 years old or something like that um but actually it's IT service desk it's it's a place where you can come in with any bit of knowledge that you have whether it's documentation or just kind of being a personable approachable person or being able to take notes and apply it um or having an idea of how to link previous aspects in um so a lot of the students were thinking they had to be um textbook smart when actually a lot of it is to do with the there's a lot of practicalness in service desk and there's a lot of uh, communication that's constantly needed and then a bit of documentation on the side to make sure you've you know put down your knowledge and the different policies that you have in the company um and they were asking about what you could do after an apprenticeship and how do you study while you're doing an apprenticeship and um there were a lot of questions about how did you balance your time between um doing exams training courses and having a full-time job um I was explaining to them that basically when you're an apprentice you get given uh, a set amount of time per week from your employer to go and do your studying and your studying is guided the whole way through by a skills coach it's provided to you from the apprenticeship company um and you can uh, the training courses you're given are directly linked to what you're doing in your role so as soon as you've learned something you can you know tell your team what you've learned and then you can apply that straight into the next project you'll be involved in or the next set of I don't know tickets or maybe you're going to go to an offsite and support a meeting event which has a lot of moving parts um there's a lot of tasks that we do on the side that aren't just tickets and SLAs there's a lot of like inventory planning there's um you know all sorts of things so they were really impressed to hear how um it didn't take up all of your time at the weekends etc etc um and that you are guided from every angle during an apprenticeship um and how you could go in with a can do attitude and you know you can get as far as you want to um and after the apprenticeship there are so many options out there because it's such a ground level good base level of knowledge and in in personal aspects and technical aspects to go out to different apprenticeships or maybe completely different role um but it's always a great place to start and it's really rewarding to go back to the students and maybe I'll hear from them a few years later or um to train the apprentices or interns here it's just it's beautiful yeah i think that's lovely and you no know, i think that the questions that you mentioned from the students like you know asking about your your work life balance and just wondering how you juggle it all really 
is questions that we all have when you're trying to get started, especially, I feel like in the STEM field, you don't talk about it as much because it's it's usually quite expected that you already know because, you know, mm. you're smart in the book. <laughs> you, you, you know all, this, all the sciencey things that you know all these cool things about IT and things. It's like, so they're like, of course you have all the, all the other stuff handled. And you're like, I'm a human too. <laughs> like I actually, actually get a little bit of support from time to time. So that's also one of the reasons why I wanted to have this panel to talk more about, you know, the diary side of it. So just kind of getting behind the scenes and really trying to learn from you guys, especially because you guys are doing it quite well. We're all, we're all kind of learning, but you know, we're, we're going quite well to learn. Um, I wanted to ask you guys more of a, I guess, the diary questions. So if you could talk a little bit more about how maybe you try to juggle some of your time, because you, we all have quite a lot of different interests. Like I know Sophie, even outside of work, you're doing all these other things as well. You want to, you're balancing a lot. Well, you're balancing a lot. So how do we juggle all of that? I'm not sure who to go to first, but I might pick on you, Belle, just because you're the first person. <laughs> <laughs> um, That's a good question. I do, I will agree. I do juggle a lot. And sometimes, you know, it's not, it's not worked in my favor. For most days, I do try to, you know, organize my time well. I have like time blocks on my calendar. The thing with me is that I have grown up in a very, you know, you do, you do a lot of work um, environment ever since I was in primary school. So I'm very used to this type of environment. Actually, if I'm being completely honest, I thrive in an environment like that because now it's the summer. I have so much of time. I, I don't know like how to organize my time that well. Whereas when you're in university, you know, you have classes like in the morning from like 9 to 11, then you have a little lunch break and then you can kind of plan your time out nicely. So I feel like as unconventional as it sounds, I feel like the more things I have on my plate, the better I I, I am able to do things. Like I don't think about, oh, I'm going to be tired or I'm, I need a nap or something. It's just do, 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 do. But the thing with that is that it will lead to burnout. So... Yeah, it's. I think I have gone through burnout a little bit, especially within the last semester, and I'm currently trying to come out of it. So, you know, that's it's very important to have like hobbies. Like for me, my hobby is to cook, and I also really like just walking around London a lot. So, those have helped me kind of cope with um, what I've done to myself for the past few years. And I appreciate you actually, you know, speaking about this and speaking about burnout. Because like I mentioned, nobody's talking about it. So when it does happen, it feels like it feels like you're the only one. So it feels like, you know, nobody else is doing that. Or if it's happening to you, it shouldn't be, you know, because nobody's saying, oh, that's happening to me too. Like it's a normal thing. So if nobody's talking about it, how will you know that it's normal and that it's okay? So thank you for your perspective on that as well. And I'm going to move over to Dubana just because we're coming back to you now. So I guess what would your perspective be on in terms of juggling a lot of things at once? Yeah, so it's similar to um, what Val said. Um, I think since I was young, I've been able to do like balance a lot of things. I used to do like dance music on top of like my education. And then when I did um, IB, we had a section called CAS. So we had to do loads of activities outside of, <laughs> yeah, outside of school. Um and like when I think about it now, the amount of things that I did whilst balancing IB, I just felt like I think doing a lot just helped me work out the timings, like what I need to do next. Um, but yeah, I think lately when it came to uni and especially masters, I've definitely felt burnt out, like with everything that I've been doing. Um, and obviously like working part time as well on top of that. Um, yeah, it's really, really hard at some points to try and balance your time out like I always like try to write a schedule but sometimes I'm I don't follow it at the end um and I eat up my time on something more specific um but yeah it is very hard to have like a strict schedule it's not always going to go your way like for me it doesn't always go to plan um but it's just making sure that you know the next day you wake up you're like okay I'm gonna you know try and finish off what I did yesterday and just making sure that you're happy and satisfied that you've done it but yeah. I think it's, it's so funny that you say it, that your advice like that, because we, we just finished um, a panel called Generational Knowledge is Power. I think, Val, you might have been in there <laughs> for that one. But um, Dr. Karika Weldon, she actually gave the same advice 
that you don't have to get everything done in one day yeah. and yeah. that it's okay to get it done another day. Yeah. But you know, <laughs> these are things that you don't think about in the moment. You're like, I have to get it all done right exactly. now. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> So it's, it's just it's funny to see like the connections that we all have like this this experience it's, it's quite good it's good to see um so Sophie I'm going to come to you now for your your opinion on it um do you know very similar it's funny how um we all have very different roles but we all have different schedules whether it be with you know with work or with side side hustles side projects or with even just personal life um but yeah, I mean, thinking back to my apprenticeship days, it was very much like you had your, let's say you had your four days at work and you try and uh, pick up all the tasks you can and maybe do some uh, documentation work. And then maybe you'll look at the infantry for the tariffs and the mobiles uh, and then you'll have your study day and you have these expectations set to you from your employer at work and you also have these expectations set to you from your skills coach and I know that can be challenging for me it was a little while ago but I mean I see the apprentices now um you know ever since I finished my apprenticeship I became an unofficial mentor for the next apprentices in our team um so it feels like I sort of never escape it essentially in a really lovely way um but you know it is they set expectations your skills coach your apprenticeship I'm talking about where you know, every month they give you a call and they're like, great, now you've done this part of your uh, report, you now need to write these 10 parts of your criteria. And it's it's very much like, even if you haven't, you might not have covered that in your role yet, because the services role is so varied in what you might cover. You might have a week of doing, of ordering laptops and building a company image and operating system onto them. And, you know, sending them out or you might have a week of meeting rooms, checking them over or you might have a week of something else. Um, So you might not cover something like data protection or something if you haven't. It might not have been a ticket that come up yet. Um, So it's trying to set the boundaries with the mentor at the time, kind of saying, well, I haven't covered that yet. But, you know, I still have this amount of time and you sort of get trained gradually when you're an apprentice which means you don't cover everything in the exact order they think you should. And it's not it's not a bad thing either side. That's the thing. It's just um, that as well. Um, plus you have revision for exams and um, things like that. And what I remember is during my three and a half years of doing two apprenticeships back to back, um, I did level three IT and then I did level four networking. Um coming out of that and then becoming a full-time employee was sort of like it was a really strange thing it felt sort of like a a weight off my shoulders of not having to essentially do a, a degree on the side of having a job which felt you know obviously intense at times but really rewarding and fun um it was and then um but then also sort of okay, so what's expected now that I'm doing service desk full time? Should I be taking on more work or, you know, uh, should I be jumping into more projects or do I just continue doing what I was doing? But it's for another, it's just for longer hours because I'm not studying anymore. Um, So that was a bit of a challenge then. And now the challenges are making sure there's the boundary between the workload that you're taking on in your role because as much as you want to be helpful to everyone, you don't need to take, you know, there's other people as well. So it's just making sure that the whole team are um, taking on the same and that everyone is trained into the same knowledge as well. Like I say, tech is changing all the time. So it's making sure that everyone is trained in the tech at once. Someone might get a different category of ticket and then you learn something really exciting and then you gather everyone around and you train everyone the this amazing fix you found. You document it and then you share out the link to everyone. Uh, so it's it's taking the time to... Only because I want to, <laughs> like, you're answering a question that I was going to ask later, so I'm going to pause you. <laughs> Sorry. Like, yes. don't answer it. <laughs> Apologies. Yeah. Apologies. Yeah. Um, I think one of the things that I've been noticing, and I spoke about this a little bit in the previous panel, was that when you're looking at, like, I think just 
I want to say women of color, but it's also been like more of a, just a women thing in general is that you're also, you're taking on so much because a lot of the fields, especially the fields that we're all in. So like, you know, the engineering, the IT, the science are quite male dominated. So when you come in, this is for the girls as well. So the younger girls, as you're coming in, I wouldn't, I'm not saying this as like a, to deter you at all, <laughs> like not in the slightest, but some of the fields can be quite male dominated. So it can be a little bit, I guess, difficult to not, I don't know, I don't know what the word it would be, but maybe make your mark a little bit. So I wanted to ask you guys if you have any advice for, I guess, just kind of making yourself known and just kind of showing that I have that expertise. Because I know we all have experiences, I will say, I'm not going to actually describe them, (laughs) but experiences of, you know, people speaking over you or just like those small little moments where it doesn't seem like a lot, but it's just, it's enough to be like, Mm, like you need to kind of feel like that okay <laughs> kind of moment so if maybe if anybody wouldn't mind just kind of talking a little bit on that making your mark especially like you know as women in the stem field i'm not sure who to call on first but anybody that's ready <laughs> kind of go ahead uh, i'm gonna pick on someone do you run i'm picking on you <laughs> i don't want to like if someone's gonna say something and i'm just gonna go <laughs> um but yeah so for me yeah it's the same thing so like I've not really had a role model in terms of scientists it was something that I chose to do um so my parents couldn't finish university and they traveled um in the in the middle of war they came all the way to the UK and had to start life from scratch so they both were in more of the maths field but they couldn't pursue anything in that um so yeah it's been very hard to like find people especially as a Tamil woman um people that are in sciences you know making it big and like you said like uh in sciences is very male dominated um so yeah I think that's again half the reason why I started this science news project because I want to inspire younger girls especially Tamil girls um to pursue you know do something in STEM but as well as be a leader as well which is I think another hard thing to find like being a good leader um and being inspired by that so I hope like doing this, I can inspire younger girls to be a leader in STEM as well, not just go into STEM. I like that. Be a leader in STEM. <laughs> and it does kind of go back to our link of looking at to see it is to be it. Because like you said, we're coming at it from like I, for example, Black Remedia woman. I hadn't seen anybody that was doing engineering. Actually, I might I might not have met any Black Remedian engineers quite yet, at least not women. And then, you know, you guys are coming into it from your own perspectives, looking at being a woman in IT, being a woman in engineering, especially like you mentioned, being a Tamil woman in the science field. It's difficult to find mentors, especially that, you know, look like yourself or that are interested in what you want to do. So I just, yeah, that's why I'm I'm so glad that I have you guys here today to be able to show the students that there are girls out there. They're doing it. They're paving the way for us. And these are the kind of paths that you can follow. So. Going back to my question, so Val, I'm going to get you to kind of just keep that ball rolling of looking at how we can make our mark, especially in in the fields that we're in. I think the one major thing that's helped me is having confidence in whatever that I do. So I don't leave any space for irreasonable, for like doubt anyone to kind of come up and question me saying hey you've done this wrong and even if they do sometimes I'm not saying I do everything perfectly but even if they do if they do it in a disrespectful manner I always put them in their place I do not I have very strong boundaries when it comes to that I do not tolerate any sort of like slander or disrespect to the work that I'm doing or even within like the societies that I've ran I do not tolerate that in the slightest bit. Like I, if you are from Hyplink, you'd know that if you do such a um, such a thing, then you'd get a strike. So I think that's also that's very important for like you know as because I also did not have a mentor, I did not have like a woman in STEM who was doing like you know the things that I was doing because it's all very niche. So it's very I think it's also good that I've kind of done these things that I've portrayed myself to be this like very confident with strong boundaries person so that I can inspire the girls in these themes or just inspire girls overall to kind of come up and be that be something of that sort and make sure that no one tramples on you or on your ideas great advice really good you know visibility so important 
um, Sophie, I'll head over to you now. Hello. Um, yeah, so I was very fortunate that growing up in the career, there were female uh, role models. There were, you know, a lot of our managers in tech um, in IT were, you know, female and they were very confident and they showed who they were in everything they did. Um, and they were very well respected because of the knowledge they had as well. So they brought them full their full self forward, their authenticity and everything. Um, and they also, you know, back themselves and they, you know, just just like anyone else, you know, is is kind of you you learn and you know what it is you're talking about and you know you you yeah you bring your confidence and your authenticity and you know you bring excitement to it as well and if you have you know queries and things like that you would speak with your team and then you know teamwork goes a long way as well especially in this role uh so it's about being a team player and also having that knowledge yourself and yeah just kind of being completely yourself and yeah that's what I basically learned from them and I'm just going to take a quick pause mainly to let the attendees know that we are in the last 15 minutes of the session this is the time for you guys if you have had questions you can either put them in the chat or if you'd like to be brave (laughs) you can also interact a little bit more with some of our panelists by raising your hand and I can unmute you if you'd like to connect with anybody and you know network a little bit as well this is your chance to do that. All these girls are very friendly and they're very willing to speak with you and definitely encourage you a little bit more. So the Q&A session is open. And if you have any questions, be sure to drop them into that chat. Um, I'm actually, I'm going to go back to Val just because I had another thought in terms of what you were saying about the, that not taking any disrespect, especially, you know, in an engineering field, because like I said, it is quite male dominated. This is not to discourage you girls at all. Because, you know, obviously we're here. So so it is very possible and definitely I want you to join it as as much as possible. But when, you know, as a woman, when you're taking that position of no nonsense, it can be labeled negatively, negatively from time to time. And definitely I do the nod. (laughs) So have you found that when you're, you know, you're setting your boundaries and you're making like your position known? And is it received well? Like, how do you how do you navigate with that as well? Um, so it, okay. Um, I don't know if it's been received well. I would like to think it's been received well, but I have heard from certain people in my course that I am a bit bossy. Well, but then when you kind of see, I kind of rationalize this into the ways that if you are a person who does your work, you're very respectful to people in your team and, you know, you're doing proper work then I'm going to leave you as you are. I'm not going to tell you what to do. I'm not going to boss boss you around or anything. But if you're lazy and disrespectful, then yes, I will boss you around. So the thing is that when I heard these things, when I heard that people are call, were calling me bossy and everything, I kind of looked at who was the source. Mm-hmm. And I kind of think of my experiences with them. And my experiences with them have not been the best. So And then I just kind of think to myself, do I really want to care about this person's opinion? No, I don't. So I don't. Mm -hmm. I think that's one thing that a lot of people I realize overlook is that they never look at the source of the opinion. Because sometimes you'll get very stupid opinions. I'm sorry, but you'll get very stupid opinions about yourself, about things in general. So you always need to assess the source of it and critically think if like you want to take it in or not. I think that's a really good point as well to think about, I guess, because, you know, the, the criticism will come. Like, you know, people will always have something to say. <laughs> that's just how people are. But it's, it's good to be able to think about how you're going to let it impact you. And I really appreciate you for giving that perspective as well. So I think we've dived quite good into the, the diary questions, and I definitely will be coming back to some of them as well. But I wanted to ask you guys a little bit more about some of the in your own fields. Are there any, I guess, exciting innovations that you've been noticing or things that even maybe you yourself are working on? Um, Giovanna, I'm looking at you because <laughs> I've been talking to you a bit more about your master's thesis and the cool things that you were doing for that. So I kind of want to ask you about the, I guess, innovative things that you've been working on in your own project. And then, you know, having to advocate for 
when you want to be able to do those things. Because that's one of the things as well in academia is that you could have a really cool idea, but if somebody says no, or <laughs> if perhaps the, the support isn't really there, it can be quite difficult. So can you talk a little bit more about being innovative or like anything exciting that you're working on for your... Yeah, so especially with this year's course, we've been learning about different types of technologies to cure different types of diseases. And yeah, so for my master's thesis, I had to basically create my own technology to cure a disease. And obviously it's very hard because it was we had to write it in like a business plan format. And it's not like we're physically like making this technology. We're just basically researching this off scratch. Um, so yeah, it took a while to get you know, our professors to be like, is it a green light, red light for our idea? Um, so I'm very passionate about looking into respiratory diseases, um, which I started from undergrad in my undergraduate th- um, dissertation. And so this year I wanted to work on a disease known as ARDS, which is a type of respiratory disease. And also COVID being a big thing, um, there's now a disease called COVID ARDS, And there hasn't been a a stem cell cure for that. So I've been working on that for the past three months and basically making my own technology from scratch, just mixing a bit of technology that's been made out there and making it into my own thing. And so, yeah, I'm quite nervous, to be honest, knowing what their opinion is going to be, because in a couple of weeks I need to present it as well. Um, Yeah, I hope it goes well. (laughs) I I think it'll be good. Um, I will pause only because we have a question from the chat. Actually, there's two questions. Hooray! (laughs) We have, um, the first one is asking, I think, Val, this might be back to you and what you were talking about earlier. Um, Anonymous attendee would like to know, what do you do if your teammates start to hate you when you're doing that kind of thing, I guess? (laughs) Bit of a difficult question. (laughs) Oh, saucy. Um, (laughs) Um, I think then it kind of comes down to the fundamental basis of it is that am I there to make friends or am I there to do my job? Am I there to lead my team? So, I mean, of course, the answer is going to be I'm there to lead my team because if I was there to make friends, I'd just be a member. So then I guess once like if my team has labeled me as a, if a good chunk of them have, have labeled me to be bossy and they dislike my work, I can't do anything about it is that as long as they do their work and like I said, they are still respectful to the environment that they're in. I don't really care as long as they're doing their work. Maybe it'll hurt a little bit, but you know, you have to brush over it as a leader. You need to brush over these things and you need to focus on what's important. But if it's something to a point where it's disrupting their work, if like they're not doing their work in form of like a protest or something, kick them out you still have the liberty to kick them out as your as the team manager of the president. You still have the liberty to do that because the thing is that you can't have these little seeds that grow in your, like your environment because once they start hating on like how it's being, like how the management is or like how, um, yeah, just like how the management is and if they start not doing their work, that's going to inspire like a little, a few more seeds to not do that. And then you're going to have a big, like a big chunk of people who just don't want to do their work because they're like, oh, she's bossy. I, I don't want to do this anymore. So you can't really have that. So the second that you see something like that, you have to kick it out and replace it with someone new. As authoritarian as that sounds, it's unfortunately how to make a good team work. So you can't really take any, everything to heart. Mm-hmm. That's good advice. You can't take everything to heart. Um, I'm going to ask the second question. Keep them coming, guys. <laughs> plenty of time for questions. Well, seven minutes, but it's plenty of time. So this question is from Kurti. So she says, hi, thank you so much for the session. I really appreciate the advice on juggling the busy diary and leading in a male-dominated field. How do you navigate decision-making when your team has conflicting ideas, ensuring that everyone feels heard while moving forward efficiently? I'm not sure if I should ask Sophie or Tivana. <laughs> I don't have to do this one. So I'm going to bug you for now and then she's going to go back to you for your answer. So, yeah, obviously with me having a management team as well as like the main team as well. Um, yeah, everyone's going to like throw in their own ideas. And at the same time, I also need to make that final decision as well. But I always do my best to incorporate 
like at least a part of someone's idea into this so this whole project itself I wouldn't say it's just me it's been a whole team effort everyone's been sharing me like their ideas and I'll take it into consideration or I'll just be honest and be like maybe not right now maybe another time or we can try it like this we can try it like that um but yeah, I do try my best to listen to people's ideas and I also talk to them. I talk with them through it as well. And I also try and give them um, advice as well, which they take in well. But like Bao said, with the whole, um, not everyone's going to, you know, they're not going to always be happy with you. I've struggled in the past with a couple of comments being like, you know, a bit bossy. I don't, you know, I don't, I feel like this is a bit too much. But again, I know what their habits are. They might be quite lazy with the work that they do. And especially with mine is that mine is online as well. So I have to keep messaging people and being like, have you done this? Have you done that? And the thing is, I I let everyone be flexible in the work that they do um, because I understand they've got their own life, university, you know, studies, jobs, whatever it is. So even with that and being flexible, they also need to understand, you know, I've given them this role for a reason. I've they need to, you know, put some effort into it. Um, but, but yeah. Thank you so much. That's okay. I would like to get um, some of your opinions. We actually have another question. So this one is more of a, well, it's going back, to, I think, to what we were talking about earlier. It's a thing, how to deal with egotistical men. And I feel like we could all answer that question. But I'm going to give it to Sophie first, and then we'll go to some other people and see what they have to say yeah I don't know I think that's a kind of it's it depends about how you kind of think about it like the way that I see it is that there's always something behind it there's it's never just black and white it's never just you know I hate you you hate me whatever it's normally they you know they may have a busy schedule or they may have other things on their mind or there's always a reason they're not telling you why something may be urgent, et cetera. Um, It's just a case of kind of getting understanding of how different people work. Like I remember when I first joined, we did a personality kind of session, like a personality quiz, and there's different types of personalities. You can research it. There's I'm amiable, so I'm, you know, about the people and, you know, just love the people and, you know, uh, but there's also different personality types like analytical like they just want to see the data and analyze it and know what they need to do next based off of what you told them like what's next what's the risk of something and that's their personality style there's also driver which is they don't have the time for the um the hellos the things like that they have other things on so you just need to tell them the facts about for example um hi i've you know replaced the screen on your screen protector on your phone and um, I just want you to test it by doing this or um I want to arrange a meeting with you but I see you're busy uh here's what we're going to talk about in our meeting if we can make it five or ten um and if you kind of approach people in the way that they need to be approached whether that's a phone call or an email or a team's chat formal informal you get the best out of everyone it's never not everyone's going to be like you um and it's just finding that's kind of one of the fun parts of the job, kind of uh, learning about people and what makes them tick, what doesn't make them tick. And everyone has their own experiences and each person that you try brings an amazing benefit to what you do in your job. You know, uh, we're all kind of interlinked and that's how that's how I feel it is. You know, so it's. It's all very opinionated if you go there, eat, go to school. And I understand where that's coming from because it might seem like war they're at you. Um, but it also just depends on the context of the situation. Um, maybe it's maybe it's about something you're not quite trained on yet and it can go, oh, okay, maybe I made a little mistake. Oh, I'm so sorry about that. Like I've done that. I've gone, oh, okay, hold my hands up. Didn't quite do it right or didn't do it in the right order. Can you show me? Can we set aside some time? Uh, and I'll... I think so it's made a point. Make notes and I'll do better for next depends on the context and why it might be that way from that person. Yeah. But I think I can add on my own experience with this as well, because when, when I was first getting into um robotics competitions, so the one that I went to is called 
first global. So it's a little acronym. I can't remember what it stands for right now, but not important to the story. But basically, I'd gone to an all-girls school beforehand. So I hadn't really experienced, um, I would say, the male ego, really. So when I went to the competition, it was for, um, we, were, we were working with three different teams. So each, each of our, each was the country, and then you'd have an alliance of two other teams. So we had an alliance. I don't remember the other country, but China was the one that I had to deal with. And when we brought over our robot, the first thing they did was take it from us. And then they started just working on it, just taking stuff off. They were unscrewing things. And we were like, what, what are you doing? So we tried to act nicely to say, like, what's going on? Ignored. So that's when, you know, I like to say my, my inner mom, <laughs> getting my, 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 my fiery personality at the time from my mother. So like that, that kind of kicked in. And I immediately was like, what are you doing? Let go of our robot, put it down, you know, having to actually assert myself. So in terms of like how to deal with egotistical men, I would say it's, it's really, it goes down to that experience. So you have to try it. It'll probably happen to you at least once, but you really just have to assert yourself and just keep in mind that you do have the skills. And, you know, you know what you're doing. And even Sophie said, if you don't know, then you can build up those skills. Ask for help. Preferably not that person, but ask for help and just kind of learn a little bit more from there. So we are at the end of the session, but that's okay. Because I think <laughs> we ran out a little bit of time in terms of coming on a bit late, but that's okay. So I just wanted to say thank you to all of you for joining me. So we had Balvinder who's the former president for Hyperlink, and now she is a research assistant moving on to her master's in biomedical engineering. We wish, we wish her the best of luck. We have Sophie, who's joining us from Renaissance Re as a service desk analyst. She can come give you a lot of perspective in terms of the IT world. And Giovanna, who can give us a lot of perspective because she's doing her master's in stem cell research and regenerative medicine at King's College London. So, you know, the big names in terms of also... Mary, which is where we came from, but just looking at these different companies and the girls that are there and how you can juggle all of this, you know, being a woman in STEM, trying all these different things, and especially having all these different interests, it can be a lot to juggle. So I hope this session gave a bit more insights into the, I guess, the woman in STEM experience, really, as I say in the title, the diary of a girl boss. So I think that's what we all are as women in STEM. So thank you guys for joining me, especially the girls. And I will see you again in 30 minutes for our press meal. So that one is going to be with a robot, just so that we're all clear. He is a talking robot. His name is Captcha. His, he's from Heat Over Research. It's a company that I met while I was on conferences, which I will tell you about later in a podcast episode. We don't have time for that today. But you can get to know Captcha a little bit more so you can ask him questions. And he does respond to you. If it was in person, he can actually track your face as well. So if you move around, he, he follows you. Pretty cool. So be sure to come back on at, I believe it is at, so that's going to be at two o'clock for me to time or six o'clock if you're in London, anywhere else. I'm sorry, he will have to Google <laughs> the time difference, but I look forward to seeing you all again in about 30 minutes. Thank you for joining me. Bye guys. Thank you. Bye.